Welcome to Talking Heads on USA Global TV, starring the one and only wonderful Dr. Jacqueline. It's a prestigious place where world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to USA Global TV and radio. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck. I'm the president, founder, and chief listening officer here at our network, where we currently have 29 live streaming broadcasts that go around the world across eight different time zones. Our show today is called Rapping with Dr. Jacqueline. It's a show about nothing. And if you're wondering what does that mean, the very first show I started with on radio about two years ago was called Rapping with Dr. Jacqueline. And then as we started to grow and add more programs, they fell underneath the umbrella of Rapping with Dr. Jacqueline. I got it trademarked and then we got so big that it didn't make any sense to have that title. So I founded USA Global TV LLC. And so now Rapping with Dr. Jacqueline is a show underneath that platform. So our show today is featuring someone who's been here before, which I absolutely love when people come back and visit with us. And on this particular program, we'll be getting to know each other, just like we're sitting in a virtual living room. My guest today is Ann Charles. She is USA Today best-selling author. Let's welcome her to the show. Hi, welcome, Ann. Morning. Hi, everyone. It's nice to have you with us. We were chatting a little backstage and we're in different time zones. Where are you joining us from today? Uh, I am from Prescott, Arizona, up in the mountains. So in the, in the desert, but high desert. So we don't quite get as you know burning hot as Phoenix and Tucson and those guys. And what brought you there? Are you from there originally? No, I, I am from a mix of uh, Northwest Ohio, and I, I spent a lot of time in Western South Dakota in the Black Hills. Uh, my parents split when I was really young, so kind of went all over. And then once I graduated high school, I lived in Southern California for a little bit and then moved um, over here to Flagstaff, Arizona, even higher in the mountains, and then went up to Seattle for about 20 years and then came back down here because I loved it so much. So been a little bit, you know, all over the place over the years. Wow, really different elevations and different weather, especially Seattle, rainy, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, it was very, yeah, and I enjoyed it for a long time. I mean, I really, you know, I worked as a technical writer then and so went into the office every day and I didn't mind the the dark and the rainy and the summers, you know, Ju July, August, September are really beautiful. But then once I was able to stop doing a day job and focus full time on writing and was home all the time, I started feeling like, oh, I kind of need to be in a little bit more sunshine again, you know. So back down to Arizona, you know, we, we came and have been here for eight years, I think now. Wow, that's so, wonderful. And you just mentioned about leaving one career and starting another. And, you know, there have been many people who have done this during the pandemic. I myself being one of them, I left my corporate career in 2020. And for others, they desperately want to do it. But it's that fear factor, typically mm -hmm. about the money or about the benefits. So what was your experience as you were doing your transition? So my, we have two children, my husband and I, and, um, he had been uh, laid off from his job right about the time my son was born. So we decided, okay, rather than pay, you know, an arm and a leg for childcare, he was going to stay home. And we had us two years later, we had my daughter. So he was uh, home with the kids and, and we had, you know, this, the one job that I did and it was pretty stable. I mean, it had some rocky moments there in 2008, you know, when everybody had some rocky moments, but it was going, it, it was pretty steady. Um, and it was a, it was a good job, but I could not keep up trying to build this writing career and having two kids and a full-time day job. I was working 
Um, you know, I'd be to work around 830 and then I'd come home about 530 and hang out with the kids, the babies and, and my husband. And then they would all go to bed around 930. And then I would stay up till around two in the morning writing and doing that part of that job. And I did that for several years. And boy, by Thursday evening, I could not keep my eyes open. I was pretty, you know, after dinner on Thursday evenings, I was crashing early. Uh, so we, that was really hard, but, you know, I was building this writing and building, you know, getting books out, starting to, you know, really work marketing and, and doing all the work that came with that. And my husband was a huge part of this too. We really are a team behind the scenes. He was, you know, he listened to me initially start swearing at my computer and he, he'd spend a lot of time working uh, for Microsoft at one point. And he was like, give me that computer. Let me help you as much as I can. And, and so and, and always there in the background, brainstorming, doing all kinds of parts, you know, for the book. So we had to make a decision, you know, when it came, we were starting to make enough money off writing. It wasn't, you know, wasn't tons, but it was coming in more normally and had to make the decision of how much longer uh, I kept doing that day job. And like so many people, there were many worries. We had two kids you know, can we do this? Can we really make a living off writing? Um, insurance was a huge factor when you have two little kids. What you got to have decent insurance, you know, you know, maybe hopefully if you can get it because that, you know, and, and that was back when, um, oh, I can't think of what is it? Cobra. When you quit your job, I think it's called Cobra. And it was so expensive, that insurance. So there were a lot of things to take into account and, and we always knew one of us could go get in a, a job again if we needed to, but it wouldn't quite be what I had or, you know, it, it just because you have to build up. So it was it was scary. Um, but we decided it's time. I need to be able to focus more energy on this, you know, and let's do the jump. Let's make it and see if we can if we can get it by. And so we did. And it was exciting and it was terrifying and all that put together, but it was, it was a great adventure and it paid off. We're still, you know, the two of us still working this, you know, writing job and um, the kids are now getting ready, you know, up in high school. So we've made it through. They, they always hear my kids will say, no, I can't do that. My mom is like, don't go breaking your arm because <laughs> it's expensive. So my kids are a little more cautious. They're not quite the daredevils. Maybe some other kids, you know, might be if they had really good insurance, but, um, they still have enjoyed a life of, you know, we could go on every field trip. We could do whatever, you know, we needed to do to be there for them, which has been wonderful as a family to be able to do that. But yeah. And then we moved down here from Seattle uh, about two years, no, a year after I quit that, the day job and kind of full on went into, this is what we're doing now, everybody. And it's been, um, there's been times when it's a little worrisome and then there's been times when it's not, you know, when it's like, okay, I think we got this, you know, but it's, it's just like every other business. It's kind of like this, depending on marketing and, and how, you know, things are going in the book world. I really admire the journey that you've been on because I can relate. I was working on my doctorate while I was working full time, but I don't have any children. So just to, to imagine that you've got a husband and children and doing all the things that you're doing, that is enormous. I don't think people have any idea of what kind of pressure that must be. And and you made it. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Well, I like I said, I was fortunate having a husband um, who's part of this is, you know, it, it felt like I wasn't going forth alone. Uh, we had each other to to kind of go together and you know we positioned ourselves financially so that if somebody had to go out and and get a job no matter the job we could afford to get by you know so we kind of set ourselves up so that we wouldn't maybe be you know ah dangling and and you know twisting in the wind but at the same time uh you know it was that leap of let's give this a try, you know, and, and there's times we think, well, you know, should we go do this? Because like I said, the market's up and down. It depends what's selling, um, how things are going. Uh, you know, right now, audiobooks have just, you know, gone sky high, which is wonderful because eBooks, that market is so saturated. It's hard to, you know, 
get out there amongst everything else for all authors. It's hard to be heard. Um, good or bad. I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, this is a horrible thing. I'm just, this is the way it is. And you have to deal with that a lot in this industry is this is the way it is. I can complain about it. I can moan. I can lay on my bed and just be like, I don't want to do this. Or I can say, okay, let's shift. How do I need to market in this type of environment? What do I need to do to be out there? And so that's what uh, every used to be every year in January, I kind of step back and analyze all this and read up on a lot of things and kind of think about how I'm going to go the next year, this next year. But now it's more like every six months um, having to change and, and shift and figure out what's going on now. So it's, it's a, it can be exciting. It can be depressing. It can be fun. It, it's, it's like so many other careers. It's just, you know, this is life as a writer. Yeah, I can appreciate that. And especially when we're so used to getting the paycheck, it's so funny, right before this show, the mail came and there was a letter from Social Security Administration. I was like, what is this? I'm only 15, I'll be 59 and a half this month. And it was showing me, you know, what the benefits that I've earned starting at 62. And anyway, long story short, they actually have your entire income history. And every year it was this, 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 this. And then 2020, it was like, what is going on? <laughs> exactly. But, and, and to your point about the insurance, the insurance is so expensive, but as entrepreneurs, we have to be committed and we have to have that passion and dedication, knowing we could always go back, but why would we? Because we've come so far, right? Right, right. There's many times when I've said, uh, you know, a long time ago, I worked in the fast food industry when I was a teenager in my first couple of years of college. And I always say, I think I'm going to go back to work in the drive through window because there's a little bit less stress involved there. So, you know, I, 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 I flirt with that and then I go, no, 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 no. OK, let's keep going. Uh, but it's just, yeah, you, you just have to tell yourself I can fall back on things. There's other things I can do um, and, and keep calm that way, because otherwise it can be really frightening, overwhelming, stress inducing. Um, sometimes with any other, like with any other business, sometimes debts go higher. Sometimes everything's paid off and everything's going great. So you just don't know what this roller coaster is going to, you know, bring around the next turn and, and trying to find excitement in that is important. And like you said, though, passion is huge. If you don't have this desire to make this happen, whatever your goal is with writing. Um, if you can't, if you lose focus of that, it can, it can be kind of depressing and, and be a real struggle for you mentally, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And by the way, I worked in fast food when I was <laughs> so funny. So, and something I just want to have us touch on is for, for many people, it's about the money. It's about the paycheck. And when you think about writing, if that were the only outcome or that was the expectation, how would that impact what it is you're doing? Oh, boy, I don't know that I would be a writer, to be honest, uh, only because the starting out is so hard. Like I said, I so I, I really the first book I published was January of 2011. I didn't quit my day job until mid 2013. So there were, you know, two and a half years plus because I didn't, it's not like I wrote a book and boom, January, I was done. And here we go into the world. That was book seven, I believe that I published or book eight. I have to go back and count, but it, I had been writing since the mid 1990s um, and, and trying to build this career in between finishing college and marriage and divorce and marriage again and having children. So there was a lot going on in life while I was still trying to become a better writer and, and make this thing happen. It didn't just magically overnight. Um, I wrote a, a book and it was publishable. There were many books first that were not and needed a lot of work, you know? Um, so I always tell people, if you're in this to get rich quick, I think you took the wrong road because this is this is not unless you win what I like to think of as the author lottery and, and you hit that book, you get that book out and the publisher loved it or you did a really great job promoting it and it just exploded and you kept putting out stuff like that. 
you know, that quality and, and getting that kind of um, reaction from readers. Otherwise, it's a grind and you have to build your product and build your business just like so many other businesses, one book at a time, you know, getting them out there. Yeah, great points. I know for me, I've got two books that are published. I've paid people to do various things for marketing and literally no sales resulted. And it's kind of like, come on, not one sale. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. That's something early on I started. I started to think of myself as, you know, Dr. Frankenstein uh, or, or, you know, a mad scientist type of thing of let's, let's approach this marketing as the mad scientist, because that way it's experiments. And if it, if it goes well and boom, it's a great thing. Wonderful. It worked. And if it crashes and burns and, you know, burns down your whole lab, well, then it was just an experiment and I can pick myself up and, and try something else. But I had to do something so that when I did a marketing, you know, whatever idea I had and it worked or not, I didn't beat myself up so much. I had to find a way mentally to be able to keep going and, you know, hurdle that problem and, and go on to the next and keep trying. Thank you, Anne. And, and how important are the awards to you, specifically USA Today bestselling author? I think they're very helpful in, in getting recognition. Um, a lot of times any, you know, just trying to get onto a, a show or get into a magazine or get something, you know, venue marketing wise, you kind of need to have a resume just like you would with a job and trying to apply to different jobs. You have to have something that's saying, here, look at what I've done here. And, and, you know, naming all these things you've accomplished and it helps to get you into many venues that you might not be able to access or, or get, you know, the door opened, you know, it, without them. So I think awards and recognition can be very helpful in the marketing world. And, and it also can draw in some readers who are like, do I want to read this person? Well, or, you know, their book, well, you know, they do have these awards, so they must be somewhat good. So it can help in that way too. Um, it's not make or break, but it is a big boost in many ways. Uh, and I've experienced that several times where if, you know, you say certain things, it helps get you into the door, you know, in, in, in something where I might not have made it through. Thank you. And how would you describe your readers, your audience? Do they fall? Oh, they're, they're so smart. And I say that a lot in, in, in different, you know, interviews I do about the readers are so smart because I, I sometimes think maybe, maybe authors don't take into account um, who's reading their books fully. Um, it doesn't matter their education level. It doesn't matter what job they have in their life. Readers are so smart in that you have to think about the product you're giving to them and you can't let them down. You have to put, you know, your heart and soul into this and you have to make it the best that you can for them. On top of that, I write series. I have multiple series that I'm writing at once, you know, changing back and forth. And I have detailed notes. I have someone who helps me keep detailed notes uh, on all kinds of things, character traits, different buildings, setting. I mean, uh, everything down to what perfume this character typically wears or cologne or what they smell like. That consistency is important because readers remember this, especially if they binge, you know, read your books and they'll say, no, I don't think he drove, he drove this color, you know, vehicle or what happened to his old Ford he was driving. Things like that, that will take them out of the story and suddenly make it not real. You know, you want, you want people to really get into that and feel like they're, it's, it's a real, they're real people. It's a real life story, you know, kind of a thing and sink into that world. But I, I just, and I'm not saying all authors, you know, a lot of them do that, but I, I always stress when I talk to other authors, how, don't underestimate your, your readers because they're very intelligent. They're wonderful. They can be right there, you know, supporting you and part of your team. So acknowledge that and, and think about that when, with everything you're doing. Thank you so much. And, and how important is the cover, the front and back covers? 
I think it's important because like many people, I will pick up a product and decide a lot of times off looks. I don't want to be like that. You know, I pick up grapefruit at the store and I want to say, I'm going to have these even though there's spots all over them. And, and I will a lot of times now I'm trying to do that more, but it's a, it's a thought you want something that looks quality, you know, like quality. Um, I don't know where this comes from. If it's just something over our life, as you continue to experience things and you go, last time I bought that grapefruit that had that big brown spot, the whole thing was rotten. So I'm not buying that again. You know, if it's that kind of thing that comes in with time or if it's just bright and shiny and, oh, this looks exciting. You know, all I think all that comes together to form what makes you choose a, a story to read. And so I do think that the cover is a big part of the sale initially. And the back cover copy is important too. Um, if I pick up a book that has just tons of reading for the back cover copy, just filling the back of the book or, you know, I, I kind of go, oh, I'm already tired. I don't know why, you know, but whether time has trained us to for that short, punchier, you know, a couple paragraphs most kind of copy, for whatever reason. But I do think it's important you learn how to write good copy that pulls them in enough to make them want to open the page, you know, give it a try. Thank you. I love that analogy that you did with the grapefruit because that it's also tomatoes. Like you look at the tomatoes and it's kind of caved in. It's like, I don't think it's going to be a good experience. So that really makes sense. It's the wrapper that. Right. Is, yeah. So I've pulled up your website. I'd love to share this with our audience if you're open to that. Okay. Okay, perfect. So let me just share my screen. All right, here we are. So uh, tell us how you keep this website up to date with everything that you've created already. Because a website's a big part of a business, whether you're an author or not. Like some authors don't even have a website, but yours is really robust and has a lot of great content. Well, Okay, so years and years ago, when I was still working that day job and I had babies, um, a friend of mine, we were before we were published, we started this little um, online, it wasn't an official business because we didn't really take money. It was more a website and a, a thing we called First Turning Point. And what it was, was it was a WordPress site where we, we did podcasts through, we posted articles, um, about writing. We took articles from other authors that were marketing related. And, and what our goal was with this website was to help show, uh, train, teach other authors how to market, whether you're published or not, how to get yourself rolling. And we needed a WordPress site. And WordPress, what, I, I just say WordPress because that was a real comfortable thing back then that you could do on your own. And so I started, I taught myself how to do that, how to, you know, some basic HTML, how to create a website. Um, she and I worked on it all the time, adding content, you know, updating it, adding new stuff. Uh, so it really gave me a background for, you know, my, my website. Now, this wasn't my first author website. I had one before that, but I soon realized I need a professional to come in and build the site to make it look good branding wise. And so I hired a, a company, they're no longer in doing this, and they made this website for me. But I stressed, I need a website that I can go in and make updates to. So we did do a WordPress site because I needed to be able to add books all the time, add content, add you know more awards as they came, if I came, uh, change up stuff, have a shopping, you know, uh, for a shop I wanted to open, an online store. So I worked with them to do all that. And then I also made sure it was user-friendly enough that I could make changes or my husband could make changes and we could update this thing constantly. So that's kind of how the website came about. And I've had it, oh boy, six years now, I think. Um, and I know a lot of times you're supposed to change it up every, you know, several years, but that's a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of time and a lot of money. And, and so for now, this is, I love the colors on this and it's easy to just keep everything updated. So just keep plowing forth with this website at this time. 
Yeah, it looks great. And and I'm really fascinated by something that you share because I am the administrator of my websites and I'm not on WordPress because I don't know WordPress. I'd like to be on WordPress, but I've been told over and over again, ooh, WordPress, no, you have to be like an expert in WordPress because otherwise you're going to, you whatever, this, that. So I thought, okay, so I'm not on WordPress for those reasons. And I'm afraid to give the the controls to somebody else because I've had my website hijacked once. So um, I don't know. So what you're saying is basically you don't have to be an expert in WordPress. You just have to have know something about it. Yes, I am no expert by far. Uh, one time I did have help. I hired someone that knows WordPress to go through behind the scenes and clean a few things up for me that were slowing it down. So periodically I'll do stuff like that. But otherwise, um, you can do a lot with WordPress. There's a lot of uh, safety measures you can put into place to try to keep from being hijacked. Uh, we do have, I mean, just last night I had some notifications that someone's trying to break in through the back door using password, you know, trying to figure out passwords. So we have to change our passwords often. We have to keep them very difficult passwords, you know, to, to, to just try to figure out. So we do have to keep working on, you know, fortifying it at all times. But um, I'm no genius. <laughs> I just spend a lot of time learning it and building and practicing on that previous site. And so by the time I came to this, um, I had a good background. I'd learned, like I said, I learned some basic HTML so I could go into the CSS style sheet and make some changes if I needed to. Um, so if you're if you're wanting to do that, you know, I recommend you go out and, and try it. Use a practice site, build something, learn all about all the different parts of it. You know, that's what I ended up doing, just spending hours and hours each day learning different parts about, you know, uh, how to do a website because I needed to have that ability to make changes myself and not, you know, knock on somebody's or can you please make that change now? I didn't want to have to do that. I wanted to be able to just go in and quickly make a change. Exactly. And, and again, I can relate to that. I have to do the same thing with all the shows we have, the people coming onto our platform. So right. that, that's good news. Thank you, Anne. I'm actually going <laughs> to start doing some more research. So I appreciate that. Uh -huh. um, let's take a look at your books. So is the screen changing there on StreamYard? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So those okay. are the different series, you know, and um, you can see down below the different squares. <laughs> yes. So for people who haven't read your book, tell us something about what to expect and where should people start? Well, it really depends on your cup of tea. Uh, so if you look at like um, AC Silly Circus, those are just novellas. There's only two so far. It's shape-shifting. It's a little bit more romance with shapeshifters and humor. Um, so that's the Silly Circus series. Um, and I, I started those because I was invited to be part of a Kindle world. And so I did, I wrote the first one, Fairly Funny Freak Show. And then that sh program shut down and I got the rights back. So then I wrote the next one, um, a bunch of monkey malarkey, I believe it is. And, you know, went from there. So that's the circus series. And, and I hope to someday keep adding to those, but they're short, short, fun, little shapeshifter circus type romance novels. So that's, that's, there's my dream of being part of the circus right there in those books. Uh, and I have than, a question for you. Sorry. Yeah. You had mentioned this before about uh, audio books. So tell us what's involved. Do you do uh, the audio books yourself? Or is this something that you plan on doing on a regular basis? So all my books, all of our books, um, I say are because my husband and I have a series included in, in this group of series. Um, they are available in audio. And that has been something since way back at the very beginning, the first year or so, second year, I think I had books coming out in 2012. Uh, I was uh, a pro, or I heard about a company local there I, when I lived in Seattle that was doing um, audio books and could help as well as other other books, but um, could help me with maybe making some audio books of Nearly Departed in Deadwood and Optical Delusions in Deadwood, the first two in that series. And so I met with them and we picked out a narrator and kind of got started and they act as my agent working with Blackstone Audio uh, to make that series. And we, we also have all of the Deadwood Undertaker series that I write with my husband, Sam Lucky, in audio through Blackstone and, and that agenting um, company. Uh, 
all the rest of the books, I they are also in audio, but I do go through ACX uh, for almost all of them, not all of them. Uh, and I found a narrator early on, uh, Lisa Larson, that I just liked her voice and she did a reading for me and she seemed to hit um, hit uh, you know everything right. So I write a lot of comedy. And it's very important that you deliver the line right so that the joke hits. Otherwise, the comedy falls flat. So I had to find an, uh, a narrator who could get my sense of humor and deliver the line just right. So if you think of the line like, you what? You know, if, if somebody reads something that's supposed to be like, you what? And they read it like, you what? It, it, I mean, it just, it's not there. So um, Lisa and I have worked together for now many, many years, <laughs> probably about 10 years. And she has done almost all of the other uh, books for me um, through ACX, which delivers to Amazon, AC, uh, Audible and Apple. However, the newest book, Twisty Tortoise Tussles, that just came out, book six of the Jackrabbit series, um, as well as Jackrabbit Jingle Balls, which was a Christmas book, uh, we are doing on our own. We purchased the whole you know, near, uh, the files from her. And so we own it all and we're going forth um, through, oh gosh, find a way and, and going wide as well as we do a lot of our own distribution through ACX and other areas on our own. So we have multiple ways that we are distributing audiobooks. Uh, my husband, the series I write with my husband, the Deadwood Undertaker series, which you can see there on the lower right. Um, that series, we have Jason... Oh, I think it's cult. Sorry, my brain's not working yet. I need more coffee. But he was, he's wonderful. And um, he reads, and again, that's through Blackstone Audio, all those books, except for the Christmas one. That one we purchased and put out ourselves as well. So you can see all the other things. That we can list all the places it's available because we have more control on who we can distribute those to. Yeah, it's amazing. I love the covers. You know, and I was thinking to myself when I was growing up and then as I got older, I used to spend a lot of time with my parents listening to audiobooks. And it's a great way to bring people together as well, especially if you're driving. And I'm talking yeah. about cassettes. You know, you'd pop right. a cassette in and listen or whatever it might be. Right. Uh, so what are your your thoughts and your feelings about how reading and whether whatever version it is how it can bring people together? Oh, I, I, I think you're right. I've, we've listened to several. So when I get the files back from, you know, whether it's for any of these books, I have the opportunity to listen, um, usually ahead of time. And so we will often, you know, be taking road trips or doing something where we're listening together. And, uh, you know, my kids have been often been with us on road trips where we're like, okay, we have to listen to these audiobooks because we've got to approve the files. So we're going to listen to this audiobook story. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, really think about sharing with my kids how that might feel reading, you know, one of our books, but they enjoy them just as well. And what's nice with that is now we're all in the same world. So when they hear us talking about characters as if they're real people, they know, oh, you're talking about this series, you know, or you're planning this. So it's for us in the business world, it's brought them more into this with us, you know, even closer so they understand what we're doing. But I do think that when you listen to stories together, it's exciting. It's like watching a movie together. You know, you're you're both think about what what you're thinking will happen next what you you know and you just get to share that with each other which is a great way to bring people together in many ways absolutely and, and one of the key takeaways that i have from listening to you is when you're planning that series you need to be so detailed and specific because your reader will catch up on the fact that you had the one character doing this, saying this, wearing this, and now it's completely different. It's like, who is this? It doesn't make sense. So right. when you and your husband are planning a series, do you have all of the books determined in advance what that content and the storyline is going to look like? No, we, we do about a book ahead. We're, we're thinking, you know, like um, we're just getting ready to release book four in the Deadwood Undertaker series. And it's the backside of Hades. That'll be out in October. But we're already talking about the next book in that series. We're plotting it. We're, we're getting everything we, you know, ahead of time so that we can start working on, on that uh, and moving forward with that book. And it's the same, you know, I just put out uh, for my own 
series, Twisty Tortoise Tussles. Like I said, Jackrabbit number six, you can see it on the screen there. But I have at the same time been starting in my head what's going to happen in the Deadwood series next, because that's the next book up to write. So I'm already starting to let myself, you know, daydream into that and, and start building what do I want to accomplish? But what I will do now is go back and I will go through all the previous 12 books. Um, some I'll read completely, others I'll skim. Like the first one I tend to skim because I've read that so many times over the years. But I will go back through the whole series, making notes, because the way I write, it's not they're not standalone series. It's a continual story. Now, each story has a story question that is answered by the end of the book. So it feels like you wrap up that book. But the series is continual where there's maybe something that happens in book five that will come back around in a big way and be a part of the plot, main plot in book seven. So it's really kind of fun, I, I, fun for me, because that's the kind of stuff I like to read, where it just feels like it's a world that you can sink into, a place you go and you know all the characters and it's fun to be there again and what's happening now. And, oh, yeah, I remember that happened, you know, before and here it is back again. So, you know, all that kind of is forming in my head now as I get ready to sit down and begin work on Deadwood number 13. How many books are you releasing on average in a year? Only two or three. I, I mean, I'd like to say, oh, I put out five or six. I wish I wrote that fast, but I write longer books, you know, 120 to 130,000 word books. That takes a while. It takes me four months usually to write a story. And then there's a whole month, a full month of editing process that we go through to make sure they are as clean and sparkly as they can be when they come out, you know, when, they, when they're out there and available. And then there's a lot of marketing that starts, you know, before it's even done, I'm starting to do marketing to push, you know, let everybody know, here comes this book. And then during and after there's a lot of marketing um, that goes on. So I, I just, because my husband, and I have that other series, we're able to put out a little bit more, sometimes three a year on a good year. But normally I just don't have the bandwidth unless I wanted to ignore my kids and my whole family in life. Um, and I just can't. Uh, I don't want to miss out on this real life stuff. So I I've tried to write 2000 words a day when I'm in the middle of writing, you know, a story and just stick to that and take breaks in between so I don't burn out too much. Yeah, before we end the show, I want to talk about what you do for self-care. But before that, would you be able to share with our audience, what is Twisty Tortoise Tussles and can you read for us from the book? Oh, I can read a little bit of the beginning. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I don't have any reading glasses. So I, I, I'll read um, just a little bit here. It's kind of the front, you know, what we have there. But Twisty Tortoise Tussles is book six of the Jackrabbit Junction series, and it stars the Morgan sisters, the three of them. They're in their um, early to late 30s, and they all have moved down to southeast Arizona where their grandfather is, and there's an RV park and a, um, a bar and all kinds of fun, crazy treasures that have been hidden in the desert by a guy that's supposed to be dead. But in this book, we're finding out he might not be dead. And if he's not, we've got a problem because they've been digging up his treasures, giving them to the cops, you know, getting dealing with them whatever the way they can to get them out of there. And he's going to be upset that they're gone. Um, but this is just a, a little start. Um, and, and it's mid, it's a few chapters in, but Claire Morgan is one of the main, she's the middle sister and one of the main characters. And Butch is the owner of the bar and also uh, the father of the, her, her younger sister's pregnant with his child. Um, so anyway, Claire zeroed in on Butch. The mother of your child is up to something. Up to what? I don't know exactly, but it's something that is making her face twitch again. Butch rubbed his jaw. What conspired prior to this twitch? Twitches, she clarified, several over a short period of time. But I can't tell you anything more than that. Why not? Mac asked before Butch could. And Mac is Claire's boyfriend. She glanced back and forth between them because Kate made me pinky swear not to say anything to anyone. She forced me into the deal by threatening to hurt my Jeep. And she added that if she hears of my tattling, she'd hurt my Jeep some more. You mean she's going to shoot it again, Mac asked, with a solid dose of sarcasm, or smear more pies around the inside of it? She didn't specify, and I didn't want to ask and risk putting ideas into her head. I simply backed away slowly and left before she started foaming at the mouth. 
Can you at least tell me if there's another person that spurred the return of her twitching? A muscle pulsed in Butch's cheek. Jeez, she's not going after Grady's deputy again, is she? Claire mimicked, zipping her lips. Dang it, Claire, Butch growled. Listen, all I can tell you is that you need to stay hot on her tracks these days and tracks day and night so that Ronnie or Penny or I don't end up in jail again. Wow. Thank you. I love it. So how can people purchase your books? They can go to your website. Websites, it's the easiest to that books page where we were at because you could see all the little icons we have where it shows you what links to go find. Now, if you're international, you can find them on Amazon International. We're on Apple. I mean, all there are a bunch of them out there as well. So we are we are wide distribution. We're not Kindle Unlimited or you know anything like that. Excellent. We do have a comment. I'm not sure if uh, if you know this person, Deb. Oh, I do. Deb's wonderful. She's been with me yeah. since just about the beginning. So thanks for showing up, Deb. Thanks, Deb. So, Anne, let's talk a little bit about what you do for self-care. Backstage, we were talking about planking. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> some of the things that you do. <laughs> I, I'm not as good at planking as you are. You are amazing. Um, I, I, for the past mm, little over a year, I've been doing PIO. Uh, I got the CDs and I started doing that because I started having a lot of issues with um, stress and sleeping, aching muscles, tension, um, sitting a lot like we do as writers. I, it's really hard on the hips. Even, you know, they say, oh, well, you need to get up and stretch every 20 to 30 minutes. Well, when you're writing a book, you get taken away and two hours later you go, oh, I need to stand up. I'm hurting now. Something's, you know, twanging in my leg. So I knew I needed to do something to keep strong in the midst of all the sitting and and while dealing with the stress i mean COVID was tough on all of us so it really made it you know all the tension coming in so i started doing um pio as well as you know some regular little yoga things i'd always done uh to strengthen up i didn't want to i don't i don't plan on going out and having a beach body that's not it my my whole mission at this point in life is just to stay strong and keep my muscles strong uh, shoulders, especially, and all the writing muscles, you know, wrists, a lot of the planks and stuff like that, keep our wrists strong so that we can do a lot of typing and all that's needed for that, Off, trying to offset carpal tunnel and all the things that come with this. And knock on wood, so far, it's, it's made a huge difference. Um, and I also will tend to meditate when I'm really stressed out and I can't focus because there's so many things coming at me. Um, going off somewhere quiet. Sometimes it's my closet and just sitting on the floor and just for a half an hour, 45 minutes, putting on this, I have a set of songs that are just music that um, I tried, I use routinely to meditate. So my brain's trained, uh, trying to do that. And I, the first five minutes I'll keep saying, no, you got to get up and do this. And I'll start to stop the music. I'm like, no, we're supposed to sit here, you know? And so it takes me a good five to 10 minutes to let myself sink into it. But I always feel so much better when I'm done, once I've relaxed a little bit and, and it just helps me, okay, let's breathe through this, let's make a list, let's put things in order and, and keep going. So there's a mix of things I do. Um, and I just bought a bike. That's a, one of the big, you know, handles are up here. So it's like a fun at the beach bike that I go riding with my, my kids and husband too. So just trying to keep active in the midst of all the writing and sitting that I do. I love how you shared about your goal is to be strong. I think that's so important as opposed to getting, you know, the the hourglass figure, whatever it is. I, I was all about that. Now I'm, I'm just completely focused on being strong. And like you, I'm in front of a keyboard all the time. So right. it's so important to keep your wrists in good condition and, and also your shoulders. Many people forget about how much our upper body, like some people can't even put uh, their suitcase in the bin on a plane right. because they have no upper body strength. So that's great that you're doing that. Well, I started to have this thing where I would get my whole, my arm would go numb and my thumb would tingle. And I, I was like, this isn't good. I'm pinching something. I'm not strong enough. It's not support. Something's going wrong up here. And that's when I, I read up about Pio, you know, Pilates and yoga together. And I realized I have to strengthen up my shoulders. You don't think about that when you're young. You just, you have strength. But once it starts fading, you start realizing I have to do something to keep this strong 
because you use these so much, whether, like I said, sleeping, waking up because, oh, I hurt so much because you didn't have the muscles to support yourself while you slept. That happens now. So yeah, it, I think you're, you're right. It's just really important to keep everything strong. Yeah, exactly. And I think as we get older, many people are into walking. I like to walk as well, but we're not doing anything for the rest of our body. And so right. these things that you're mentioning, the, the PIO, can you give us an example of a, a type of exercise that would be included in the PIO workout? Oh, boy, it, it starts slow and easy, but there's things that are like side planks where you're up on one arm. You know, imagine me horizontal, one arm holds you up, the other arm's up in there and you twist underneath and you reach and you pull it back out. That's incredible work on your shoulders. Plus just there's tons of downward dog time where we're lift, downward dog and then you're lifting a leg up. And so you're holding yourself up so much with your shoulders. And there's a lot of tricep push-ups and stuff like that. You could be on your knees. She says, you know, it's fine to be on your knees. So you're building, you know, this, you're doing a lot of that to keep your upper body strong. So it's, it's really a, uh, it's a tough workout and I feel my age a lot of times. Uh, but I do like how I don't, I don't worry about lifting, you know, something up over my head anymore. And that had become a problem. I couldn't reach behind me and lift my purse without it hurting. But now that's not even something I think about again. Great points. And also people don't even realize with your neck, when people are driving, they can't even turn their neck all the way around because right. it's in kind of in a locked position. We've got another few comments from Deb. Thank you, Deb. Um, I hear you. I'm old and depressed. <laughs> yes, Deb, we're getting old together, aren't we? <laughs> and Amazon.ca in Canada to get your books. So Yes. Yeah. She's great. Deb, thank you for years of all your support. You've been wonderful. Yay, Deb. Thank you for being here today. So, Anne, we're about to close out. I want to spotlight you again. And we've had your banner up and we also have where people can get your latest book. But for people who can't read the banner, what's the best way to get in touch with you and who should contact you? Uh, www.annecharles.com. I have everything up from the, from books. If you go to the blog, I don't use it as a blog. I use it to keep like this interview will be on there under 2022 interviews. You can find, um, the newsletters that I put out once a month, you can usually find, you can, um, I should say usually once a month, you can find the link to those newsletters and we put everything in there as well. So you can read what's going on. Uh, and then there's a connect page where you could, you know, send me a, a, something directly from the website or it gives my email address. If you're media and you want some media photos and, and to learn more, uh, my publicist is listed there as well as some photos you can use and some lists of a few things I've done. Uh, I do speaking engagements periodically. I do all kinds of stuff. So um, the website is the best place, but I am on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I'm even on TikTok. I took a break to get a couple books out this summer, but I do plan on going back and having more fun there. So I'm on all those things and LinkedIn as well. Um, and YouTube, I have a YouTube channel that a lot of times will I'll do, I've done a lot of stuff over the years with, with readers, um, YouTube little shows and talking about books and having online um, book sales. So you can see those there as well. Well, Anne, thank you so much for all the wonderful content that you're putting out into the world. And thank you for how you've made it so easy for people to find you. I, I see so many times people who have inconsistent branding and they've got one, you know what I'm saying? You've made it right. very, very easy for people to find you and buy your books. Well, thank you for having me on here. It's been fun talking to you. And I'm going to try to do my planks a little longer to be like you because I've been watching you and you're incredible. So I got to up my game just a little bit more. Well, thank you. One thing I'll share with you, this is really important. I do some wrist exercises before I start. And then after I'm finished, my wrists are like literally locked. Like I have to push my hands together. So I'll sit on my wrists. Mm. So I, I turn my wrists over and I sit on them and put my legs out like a leg lift. And then what happens is from yoga, you know, the whole premise, you cut off the circulation temporarily and then new fresh blood goes there and then you get your feeling back. Oh, I'm going to have to try that. Thanks yeah. for that tip. I've not heard of that before. So that's interesting. All right. You can also just, um, I'll try to explain this. If you turn your arms over like beach volleyball and you lie on them so that your elbows are right under your hips, uh -huh. can you imagine that? Okay. Yeah. And then you lift one leg and bring it down, lift the other leg, bring it down, then lift both legs. You get all fresh blood going through your from your elbow all the way down. So it really helps with carpal tunnel or 
Keeping so there are my recommendations from teaching yoga for years. I love that. Thank you. I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to try that today. Thank you. you know, actually, I'll make a little video and I'll put it on my Facebook. So yes. Can, not right now. but No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no I want you to do it with the pearls and all because that's, that's exactly. or the, the necklace in, and all. In the dress. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> thank you very much, Anne. And thank you, Deb, for engaging with us. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right. We'll see all you later. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much to each and every one of you for watching, whether it's on the live or the replay, whether you're listening to one of our radio channels or on one of the podcast uh, platforms. Please do reach out to Anne. She has a lot to offer. Her website is annecharles.com. And I really encourage you to buy her books and support her work. All right. We're coming back very shortly with our next show, which is Talking Heads. If you're not familiar, Talking Heads is our platform for expert presenters from around the world who have their own 30 minute show. And during this show, they provide information about their expertise, about their knowledge to help us be better people personally and or professionally. Our next talking head is Mr. Al Sini, followed by the show after that, Talking Heads, which is Caroline Keward. So please do join us. I'll be going over to the other studio to produce the shows. And once again, thank you for your loyalty. Please do subscribe to our channel, USA Global TV and Radio over on YouTube. Thanks again. Bye for now.